All right. So if you would like to just begin by um, just allowing yourself to find a comfortable position, one that feels upright but yet relaxed. And if you'd like to, you can close your eyes or lower your gaze. Just allowing your attention to come inward. Allowing yourself to set down the busyness or stresses or concerns of your life outside of this community. Just giving yourself this moment and just knowing that your decision to come tonight in itself is just an act of compassion towards yourself and towards the world and to those you love. So just taking a moment to check in with your body, just adjusting and settling in. And knowing that there's nowhere else you need to be and there's nothing else you need to do and there's no one you need to be. You're just allowing yourself to settle into this present moment. Bringing your attention into being here now with the intention to meet whatever arises with perhaps curiosity or kindness or compassion. And perhaps you'd like to start by just taking a few deep breaths. If this is something that is comfortable for you. Letting the air come into your lungs and your belly fully and completely. And then releasing it softly and gently. Doing this in a way that feels comfortable for you, just allowing the air to come in, the chest and the belly expands, and then letting the air release. Not straining or pushing in any way. Just allowing the body to fully experience the joy of breathing. And then just allowing the breath to settle into a natural rhythm, whatever feels good to you.
and just allowing your breath to be the anchor that brings you back to this present moment. Following the breath as it enters and leaves the body. And each time that you notice that the mind has wandered, just noticing that with a kindness and a sense of gentleness, to bring your attention back, back to being here, sitting in your chair, feeling the breath move through the body. Feeling your whole body being rocked and caressed by the breath. You can just take a moment to gently scan the body and just notice if there's any tightness or tension in the body that you don't need right now. Just allowing it to soften and release. And if thoughts arise, it's re important to remember that they are not the enemy. It's merely what the mind does. And if you notice thoughts arise, you can just note them without judgment and with kindness. And then return to your breath. We can even sort of imagine that we can breathe from the heart center. 
perhaps even putting our hand or our hands on our chest and just feeling that place of the heart and even imagine that we can breathe in and out from that center of the body. And imagine in this, we can offer ourselves care. We can offer ourselves presence and non-judgmental awareness, a loving awareness. It's as though we can hold our own hand as we just notice what arises and then we let go and come back to this kind and gentle presence with ourselves. And sometimes we might notice that there's a lot of agitation or maybe sadness, difficulty, anger. And we can just note that and then come back again. So just imagining that we're breathing through our heart center with a kind regard for ourselves in the midst of whatever is happening. We can always come back, come back to this place of kind regard, of presence. And as you hear the bell, you can ever so slowly open your eyes, moving your body very gently, and then bring your attention back to the group. Maybe your body might like a little stretch. I'm going to give the two-minute summary of uh, mindful self-compassion, and then I'm going to uh, make a few remarks. So uh, Jane and I have been teaching a class called Mindful Self-Compassion for many years, don't know how many now, and it's based on a curriculum that was written by Chris Germer, who's a clinical psychologist at Harvard, and uh, Kristen Neff, who's an experimental psychologist at UT Austin. And uh, together they collaborated to develop this curriculum to um, help people to be kind to themselves, basically. Uh, and for many people who have taken the class, including myself, and I think I can speak for Jane as well, self-compassion was the missing link in our practice. I personally had spent decades trying to do it right uh, in terms of meditation and other practices. And uh, there was a lot of striving and a lot of self-criticism and a lot of comparing and a lot of things that were pretty unkind uh, when, it, when it came to myself. So when I took this class, I, it really changed my whole relationship to the practice and to myself. 
and I, I, I think Jane shares that, at least some of that, and many of the people who have taken the class, I think, have benefited in the same way. So if you have any interest in that, uh, Jane and I are going to be offering a kind of a shorter version of it on Zoom uh, beginning in November. It'll be on the calendar soon at Common Ground. And you can also take the longer course through the Center for Mindful Self-Compassion if you choose to do that. We just found that it was, hmm, um, it could be pretty tiring to do two and a half hours on Zoom. So we shortened it a bit and, um, and added some of our own material and got rid of the stuff we didn't like it so much. So we call it something a little different. It's called Inner Self-Compassion. Uh, so Chris and Kristen uh, identify three components to mindful self-compassion. The first one is mindfulness, or the ability to be aware of the fact that we're suffering. The second one is self-compassion, or a response to that suffering that is kind and compassionate as opposed to harsh, self-critical, whatever your response might be. And the third is a sense of common humanity or shared humanity. So when we're able to actually acknowledge our own pain, to respond to it with kindness, it opens a door to a connection with the rest of humanity, really, to an understanding that we are all suffering and that we are all deserving of kindness. So um, a lot of the practices in the class are geared towards cultivating that kindness because for many of us it doesn't come easily and jane um, actually highlighted some of those in her guided meditation when she was inviting uh, you to put a hand or hands over your your heart so that's what's called soothing touch and mindful self-compassion also perhaps offering yourself uh, gentle phrases or soothing words um, breathing, she, she suggested breathing. So there are a variety of things that you can do that will make it more likely that you will be kind to yourself in the future. And if you practice them, then I think that, that it actually has that effect. So I will be using some of those as well in the, in the meditation that I'm going to offer later. And so we'll have um, a chance to, to uh, practice some more. But before we go to that, I'm going to offer a few remarks. And uh, I was, Jane and I were talking about our um, personalities. And uh, I, I'm a Virgo and I'm also a five on the Enneagram, if you know what that means. So I'm a person that loves ideas and I love concepts. And so uh, I'm going to be talking about some ideas because that's what, really, what I really like. But ironically, the practice is not about ideas, it's about, it's about the heart. So um, if my ideas get in the way or confuse you or bore you or whatever they might do, just turn, them, turn off your, turn off your, can you turn off the, stop listening <laughs> and, uh, and just pay attention to the body and the heart and then we'll actually have a chance to practice. So, um, it was, I think it was almost 18 months ago that Jane and I pivoted from doing this group in person at Common Ground and teaching the class in person to Zoom. And I don't think I will ever forget that, actually. Um, we had to do it quite quickly. And like many people who have been on Zoom, uh, we thought, Maybe we couldn't do it, or we didn't want to do it, or all sorts of things. We were unfamiliar with it and not sure. And I think that we found, or I can speak for myself, I found that actually it can work quite well. It's, um, I think we, we miss the, the physical, the physical contact, but there is an intimacy that grows even on Zoom through these practices. And so we've really been exploring this adventure of building that community on Zoom. And here we are 18 months later and COVID is still here, uh, albeit in a different genomic sequence. 
and we're still practicing self-compassion. And it seems like we need it now more than ever. It's been 18 months, who, who knows how long it will be going forward. And self-compassion is, is a real, uh, it's a critical necessity, I think, for the world, for all of us. So recently I came uh, across an article by somebody named um, Tony Bernhard. Maybe you know that name. She, uh, the title of the article was Self-Care in an Uncertain World. She wrote it in May of 2020, so it was right after the beginning of our waking up to COVID in this country. And when I saw the, her name, I remembered that she had written a book that I read years ago, which is entitled How to Be Sick, A Buddhist-Inspired Guide for the Chronically Ill and Their Caregivers. And that book was published in 2010. Is, any, is anybody familiar with that book? Raise your, oh, okay, great. So I actually don't have it anymore. I don't know what I did with it, but um, I remember reading it. I, I was very struck by the, the title. So um, for those who are not familiar with Tony, she was a law professor at the University of California, Davis for 22 years. Uh, when she got sick with what was initially diagnosed as an acute viral infection. So just that fact alone seems like that makes it very um, relevant to what we're going through today. So that was 2001, 9-11, 20 years ago. And 20 years later, she's still sick. And it, what, what she's suffering from has been diagnosed as a variant of chronic fatigue syndrome. So it's like chronic fatigue syndrome on steroids. It's very debilitating. So she, because she suffers from chronic pain and fatigue, she, that has rendered her unable to teach law. But she has continued to inspire people with her teachings about the intersection of Buddhism and chronic illness. So if you're somebody that's interested in that, I highly re recommend her books. She has more than one now. She has a little workbook and she's got the original book. Um, oh yeah, and there's a, something in the chat. Her latest book is How to Live Well with Chronic Pain and Illness. And of course you can find them on Google, on Amazon, or wherever you look for books. So in this article that I saw in Tricycle recently, she said something that really, really struck me. And the sentence was, the way you treat yourself is one of the few things you control in life. So I'll say that again. The way you treat yourself is one of the few things you control in life. And I think because I, anyways, feel like I have so little control over so much right now, it was something about that that just really hit me. I mean, I've heard that said in a variety of ways for years in Dharma centers and circles, but I've never heard the, the word control used, at least in Dharma centers. Control is almost a no-no. <laughs> And so it was very, it really struck me that she used that word. And I thought what she said um, was, was both really significant now and also true when I thought about it. And I don't know if you're like me, but you can hear the same Dharma talk, you know, a hundred times. And then the hundred and first time, it's like, oh, that's what they've been saying for a hundred times. So I kind of had that that feeling when I read that sentence. The way you treat yourself is one of the few things you control in life. So I'll just pause there for a moment and take a breath. So the control that Tony is talking about, I believe, is the control we exercise when we choose to acknowledge our own suffering and respond to it with kindness. If we minimize or we ignore it or we criticize ourselves 
respond with harshness, we've exercised a different kind of control. We've made a different choice. And it's a choice to perpetuate our suffering. You may have heard of Ajahn Chah. He's one of the, the greatest Thai forest teachers. He's the teacher of Ajahn Sumedho and uh, Ajahn Suchito and many other prominent teachers in the Thai forest tradition. He said that there are two kinds of suffering. The suffering that leads to more suffering and the suffering that leads to the end of suffering. So when we make the choice to turn towards our suffering and feel it, instead of minimize it or repress it or criticize ourselves for having it, that is the suffering that leads to the end of suffering. We make the choice to turn towards, to feel it, and through that feeling it with an attitude of kindness, it lessens the pain. At least that's my experience. So for those who like scientific evidence, maybe there's some of you in this, in this group tonight, uh, there was a recent article in a BP, BBC, Science, BBC Science Focus magazine, which I listened to the podcast while I'm walking. And it was an article by a neuroscientist uh, named Dr. Lisa Feldman Barnett. And she said something very interesting that seems to support this idea. So she explained that for a long time, scientists were sure that emotions were caused by dedicated brain circuits. So we have a circuit for fear. Maybe you've heard of the amygdala. This is supposedly the fear center of the brain. And when the amygdala is stimulated by a visual cue, then it sets off a whole cascade of things that happen in the body mind that results in fear. And we also have circuits for happiness and circuits for anger and whatever you have. And these circuits, when triggered, will automatically set in, in uh, motion a particular pattern of facial expression of bodily state and physical action. And as a, a retired therapist, this is what I was taught, right? Uh, that, that there's a whole kind of preordained set of things that happens when we witness something that, or experience something that triggers this, this pattern in the brain. Uh, so for example, if we saw a snake, a support, supposed fear circuit would activate, causing our eyes to widen, our heart to race, and our body to prepare to flee. That's a fight flight actually freeze response. But Dr. Feldman Barnett explains that actually most of the scientific evidence for this doesn't exist. It doesn't support this view. And I thought, what? <laughs> um, she says that rather, the research suggests that emotions such as fear are guided. It's, it's very complex. It's not as simple as just this one sequence of events that uh, fear, the emotional response of fear is, a, is created by both memories of past experiences, the current context, and our brains, as she put it, our brain's best guesses of what our bodily sensations mean. So there are many different things that come into play to make up an emotion. And she, this is a quote, your brain constructs these guesses in a blink of an eye, so rapidly, in fact, that emotions feel like uncontrollable reactions that happen to you when emotions are actually made by you. Now, I found that very encouraging, that there, there seemed to be more freedom in how we respond emotionally to a set of circumstances. And maybe the next person on the BBC Science Focus will say that there's other research that says something different. But I, I actually was encouraged by that research. It's not so deterministic as I thought. So when we, when we practice mindfulness of the body, um, we be, by doing that, we, um, we cultivate the ability 
to change or to control, as using Tony Barad's words, our emotional response to a situation. It's not predetermined. So we have memories of past experiences, we have bodily sensations, we have the current context. And with mindfulness, we can begin to kind of sort that out, be present with it, and decide how it is we want to respond to that, to that moment. And the starting place is the body. So as, as uh, Dr. Feldman Barnett says, that your brain constructs guesses about what emotion to elicit in a blink of an eye. And these are emotions, are, are reactions to what it's sensing in the body. So maybe that's why the Buddha made the body the first foundation of mindfulness. Maybe he understood that. It is the body where we begin to uh, cultivate an emotional response. And those who have read uh, Rezma Menachem's book, My Grandmother's Hands, if you've read that, you'll be very familiar with this concept of starting with the body, especially as it relates to anti-racism work. So I'm going to take a breath. This is a lot of words. As I said, I like words. <laughs> so we don't have control over COVID. We don't have control really over climate change. We can do our part, but ultimately we can't control it. We don't have control over the suffering of others across the globe or even our own mistakes and misfortunes. But we do have control over our response. And with awareness and intention, we can choose compassion over harshness. We can choose happiness over suffering. And this is what the practice of mindful self-compassion is all about. So mindfulness or awareness strengthens our ability to stay with the felt sense of the body, whatever it is. And self-compassion practices increase the likelihood that we will respond with kindness rather than our conditioned responses of shame, guilt, self-criticism, or what have you. And when we practice in a community such as this, we realize that we're not the only ones. We realize that we're not alone in our suffering, that it's a part of being human. Take a break. Ah, oh, Jane. I was just going to say one thing um, that I like about self-compassion is I think sometimes we wait around for somebody else to treat us the way we want to be treated. And we value their kindness more than we value our own kindness towards ourselves. And that's been a really powerful, that's, it's my, my care for myself is important. And that thing that I so deeply desire, I can give to myself and it matters. <laughs> so uh, I, I really love that piece of what you're saying tonight, Jean. Thank you. Thank you. That reminds me, I used to get really honked off when I didn't get a bouquet of flowers on my birthday until I realized that I could give myself flowers and then it kind of solved the problem. So. <laughs> uh, uh, and took the pressure off other people. <laughs> So uh, one of the ways we can offer ourselves compassion is through moving the body. So um, Jane, if you'd be willing to lead us through a, a little short practice of that, and then we'll do another guided meditation. Thanks. All righty, thank you. So let's, um, in that, in that uh, whole feeling of what we have tonight, let's just think about moving our body gently. And I'll just offer some suggestions, but I, I really want you to do whatever feels good. And I, I see some people already standing up. So if you like to stand up, stand up. If you'd like to sit down, sit down, whichever you like. I, we can do this either way. So let's just start maybe by just big breath and a little wiggle. How about just wiggle, see how it feels. And you can turn your camera off or get out of the way so nobody can watch you, but just wiggle. And when we start to wiggle, we start to notice where's those little aches and pains. It's like, oh, sweetheart. Oh, and just let them. And maybe... I don't know about you, but I hold all kinds of tension in my shoulders. And every time, I kind of roll my shoulders and let them relax. 
maybe even give yourself a massage in the neck. Sometimes I get ideas. I watch people, what they're doing, and I go, oh, that looks like that feels good. Uh, and then maybe just bring your arms up. Nice, big stretch if you can, if it feels good. Maybe grasp your hands and stretch to one side. See how that feels. Again, not pushing too hard. This is just about being kind. And to the other side, bringing your hands down. Maybe you want to shake them out. That's one of the great things that we learn from animals. They shake their bodies out and it feels good. And then maybe just letting your, um, twist your, your um, body in a way, just very gently. If you're sitting, you can twist or if you're standing. And I feel like it's like you're wringing out your spine and it feels good. And then maybe just going the other way. And then maybe just giving your legs a wiggle. If you're standing up, you can stand on one and move your ankle. Or if you're sitting, you can do that. Maybe rub your legs, give them a little massage. And then the other, moving your ankle letting the joint get some exercise, movement, massaging down your legs. And then maybe just come to rest for a moment and scan the body and say, oh, sweetheart, is there anything you would like? Like maybe your lower back would like to just a little stretch. Or maybe your back would like a little arch. Looking up, just noticing what is it that would feel good? Maybe your neck, would like a bit of a stretch. Just noticing and responding. This is a lot about what Jean was talking about. We first need to notice to be able to offer kindness. So just noticing what might feel good in the body right now and then offering it. Maybe your wrists would like the movement or your fingers would like some massage. Maybe your ears would like to be wiggled or squeezed. Your jaw, get a little bit of massage. Doing this all with great kindness and appreciation for all that our body does. Even though there might be frustrations with our body, we also know how much it does. So again, maybe just to shaking out, wiggling to end. Brushing. And then coming back to the group. Every time I do that, I go, gosh, that feels good. I should do that more often. I should do that more often. That feels good. <laughs> Thanks, Shane. So we're going to have a guided practice. If my words are too much, again, you can just uh, turn your attention elsewhere. I once had somebody say to me once, why don't you just shut up <laughs> after I'd led a guided meditation. So we all have different preferences. Take them in, take what's useful and leave what isn't. So when we're practicing mindful self-compassion, it's important to have the body comfortable. So Jane set us up so that's going to be more possible. But if you'd like to lie down or find some other posture other than sitting, then please feel free to do that, whatever would make sense to you in this moment. So taking a moment to find that comfortable posture. And if it feels comfortable to you, then you can close your eyes or keep them gently open.
and beginning to draw your attention inward by bringing your attention to the body. The weight of the body sitting. The contact with whatever you're sitting or lying on. Feeling the body sitting. And taking a moment now to reflect on an aspiration for this practice period. Perhaps the aspiration to be present with whatever arises in body and mind with an attitude of kindness. May I meet my experience with compassion. May I learn to treat myself as I would a friend. May I choose kindness. So choosing an aspiration that supports your heart mind, while acknowledging that this may not be your first response to what arises, but you can still commit to the path of kindness nevertheless. So holding your aspiration in your heart as you return your attention to the felt sense of the body. How do you know you have a body? Noticing the sensations in the body. Especially perhaps any sensations of weight, of solidity, of hardness. This is the earth element in the body. The earth element in the body resting on the earth below. Earth touching earth. Inviting the body to rest and to be supported by the earth. Resting. And now allowing the sensations in the body to recede into the background of your awareness and bringing into the foreground the sensations of breathing. Feeling the breath as it comes into the body and as it leaves the body. And 
not needing to make the breath be any different than it is. Just allowing the breath to be as it naturally is. Feeling the soothing rhythm of the breath as it nourishes the body on the in-breath and cleanses the body on the out-breath. Feeling the soothing movement of the breath within the grounded stillness of the body. And allowing that movement of the breath and the stillness of the body to be the ground from which you move your attention now to a thought or memory of a time when you responded to someone or something in a way that you regret. I'm not taking the most difficult situation, but remembering perhaps a time when you responded with irritation to a friend or family member, or a time when you didn't step forward to offer help to someone in need, or sank into rage at those whom you disagree with. bringing to mind a memory of a time when you responded in body, speech, or mind in a way that you now regret. And as you do so, dropping your attention once again down into the body, feeling the sensations in the body as you recall this event. felt sense of the body. Allowing yourself to fully open to the feelings, pleasant, unpleasant, either pleasant or unpleasant. not needing to make the sensations be any different than they are. Just what's here, right here and right now. And if what you notice in the body is contraction or constriction or tension, the physicality of regret or self-judgment or harshness. Opening fully as best you can to the full range of these sensations. This is suffering. Dropping the mental proliferation and just feeling into the body. And letting whatever you feel in the body be held within your aspiration, your wish to treat yourself with kindness, with compassion. We all make mistakes. We 
all think and behave in ways we wish we hadn't. This is a part of being human. So perhaps putting a hand or hands over your heart or elsewhere on your body as a gesture of compassion, of soothing touch. is a sign that you are making the choice to hold all of your experience, the joys, the sorrows, the celebrations, the regrets, holding it all with compassion. Intentionally turning your mind from regret to compassion. Making the commitment to take control of the part of your life where you can exercise control. Control over how you treat yourself. May I hold myself with compassion. May I treat myself as I would a friend. May I choose kindness. And now expanding your awareness from your internal experience, the boundaries of the body and mind to the space around you. Sensing into the space in the room and the space that surrounds all of us in this community. All of us occupying the same spiritual space, if not physical space. All of us experiencing in some way or another the suffering of being human. Inhabiting a human body with a human mind. All of us exposed to so much that is out of our control. To so much suffering in the world. And committing to the practice of compassion or it's the only one who we can really can control ourselves. Supporting one another with the energy of our commitment to compassion for ourselves and ultimately for all beings. May we all be free from suffering. May we all know compassion. very gently if you choose to you can begin to move the body a little bit open your eyes if they've been closed so that was one offering for how we might cultivate uh, this attitude of kindness towards ourselves, just one 
one way in. Is there anything anyone would like to share from that practice or reflections on our topic this evening? Um, Jean, I was, I was um, reflecting on uh, the, the piece that you're offering about what we have the control. Uh, and then I, I was thinking about all with people's comments, all that resistance we have. And I think sometimes it's how we've learned to try to stay safe. Like if I'm critical of myself, somebody else won't criti criticize me or if I watch out what everybody else wants, then I'll make sure I give them what they want and they'll love me. And, and I think sometimes those parts of ourselves, we can't win the argument with them. <laughs> That's what I was thinking about. It's, it's kind of just like, yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it. And I'm gonna try this instead. <laughs> so I don't know if that rings true for other people, but I just know how powerful in my body and in my life, those resistance to being kind to myself is. And I can, I know where they come from. And I oftentimes don't win the argument with them. I just have to say, yep, I'm gonna just play by you anyway. So I would love to hear your thoughts, Jean, or anyone else's thoughts about that. Yeah, thanks, Jane. I think that's so true. Um, Jane likes to say that I like to say, tell the story about treating that part of ourselves that is trying to keep us safe, you know, to not let them take over, but to treat that part of ourselves with kindness. So as though we were a passenger in the car, putting it in the seat next to us, we're driving the car, it's in the passenger seat, putting the seatbelt on saying, okay, you can ride along with me, but you're not gonna drive the vehicle. And sometimes it's a whole busload of people. But um, so, so recognizing and honoring that aspect of ourselves and the, role, the important role that it may have played without letting it take control. Thanks for, for offering that. These things are, are they, they serve a function to keep us safe or protected in some way. Jane, did you wanna offer something? I, I just love what you're saying. I can really resonate with it. Um, but I think so much that we think by being harsh to ourselves, we're going to get ourselves not to do it. <laughs> and it doesn't work. And, and I, love, I love the idea that awareness offers us choice, that the more aware, you know, through our kind understanding of what we do, the more aware we get. And and we kind of get more aware of the chain of events. You know, we kind of like, oh, here I am again. I'm doing that thing again. But the awareness, maybe we see the pattern a little earlier. And maybe we go, oh, maybe I could choose to do something a little bit different. And maybe that might, in the long run, feel a little better. Um, so hopefully that might be what we can do but i always i love that idea that awareness offers us choice and we can and we can feel it once we start to feel it we can feel it sooner um so those are just some thoughts i don't know maybe other people have uh experience or um thoughts about that creates that space where we either react or respond and the space allows the response which may not be our habitual reaction. All right, we are getting close to our end time. So I uh, wanted to make sure we had enough time to uh, share the merit. And uh, it's an act of generosity just to show up and share your, your wisdom. So thank you. So let's um, reflect for a moment on the goodness of our all coming here tonight, of our sharing the practice, of our reflecting and offering our comments to the, to the, the good of the whole and uh, reflecting that our practice is done not only for our own benefit, for the benefit of all beings everywhere. Not only human beings, but the beings that 
live in the oceans and the seas, the beings that fly, the beings seen and unseen, all beings everywhere. So may the goodness of our practice, of our intentions, of our willingness to show up and work towards compassion and kindness, may that goodness be dedicated to the welfare of all beings everywhere. May all beings everywhere be free from suffering. May all beings everywhere know compassion. So thanks again for coming. We'll be here next month. God willing and the crick don't rise. <laughs> and uh, eventually we will be together. We'll probably do some sort of hybrid so those who are not in the Twin Cities can join as well. So it's been a pleasure being with you all and learning from you. Thank you.